Hello, my name is Ray Hughes and I'm an interviewer with the Veterans History Project out of the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library for the Veterans History Project in Washington, D.C. And today we have the honor and privilege of interviewing a World War II veteran, Richard Channing Jameson. And today's date is the 21st of September 2016, and we are, we're at the home of Mr. Jameson. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you, sir, and is it all right just to call you Dick? Or? <coughs> Dick is fine. All right. Uh, Dick, if you will, we'll get a little biographical information first. Um, you were uh, born here in Batavia, Ohio? Oh, actually born in Cincinnati, but uh, lived all in Batavia. Uh -huh. And what were your parents' names, uh, Dick? <coughs> my father was Donald Jameson and uh, my mother, Elizabeth. And, uh, well, they passed away in uh, 1972. Uh, and your mother's maiden name? Uh, was Hunt. Hunt. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what about your grandparents? <coughs> Well, my uh, great-grandfather uh, started a bank in Batavia. That was back then around in 1870 or something like that. And that was, uh, <coughs> and my grandfather was president of the bank in Batavia, the same bank that had been started by his father. And that was, uh, and my grandfather was uh, great on the, the uh, town band. He was conducted the Batavia town band that played concerts on Friday evenings in the town square. Where did your people come from originally? In Scotland. The, in Scotland? I see. And um, where did you go to high school? A uh, grade school first, uh, actually. Um, all of my schooling was in Batavia. Batavia elementary and then Batavia High School. I see. Graduated from Batavia High School in 1941. 1941. Now did you go to college after high school? I went to uh, Hanover College and uh, <coughs> down near Madison, Indiana on the river and <coughs> it was associated with the Presbyterian Church. I, that's how I got introduced. My pastor suggested that I consider Hanover and it turned out to be a, a fine uh, decision to make. Did you start there in 1941? Started in for 1941. Uh, I can still remember living in the freshman dorm and uh, heard a crowd gathering down in the lobby and they had the uh, radio, of course there weren't any televisions in 41. <coughs> and they were all listening to the radio and a place called Pearl Harbor had been struck by uh, Japanese bombers. And so that was the Pearl Harbor incident. December from the 7th. From December 7th. And from then on our lives were changed. And uh, <coughs> actually uh, I of course didn't do anything about it until the next year when uh, another fellow myself went to Louisville and enlisted to avoid the draft in reality. I thought I'd try that. So I was in the reserve and I came back to school as a sophomore in college. I was in the Phi Delta, Phi Delta Theta fraternity. And when I <coughs> had returned for my sophomore year, uh, we knew we were going to be going into the Army and we, uh, all the fraternities would get out early in the morning and march around. You could hear them yelling and it was uh, an experience back before the <laughs> we had an experience going into the Army. And uh, after uh, about 1943 uh, in March, uh, half of the fraternity house, or maybe a little over half of them, had already gone. And I got itchy and I wrote a letter and said, I'm ready to go. And so 
10 days later, I got my <laughs> instructions to report to uh, <clears throat> Louisville. In, in March Michigan. of 43. March of 43. Yes. And that's when I went into uh, <clears throat> Fort Benjamin Harrison Reception Center in Indiana. And uh, usually you went in there and you didn't stay there for more than three or four days and were sent out. Uh, <clears throat> for some reason, they kept me there for two weeks. And to avoid kitchen police, so I, I got a, a job as a runner, message center. And then I, uh, <clears throat> when I shipped out, I was finally ended up in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, in the Engineer Re Training Center, Replacement Training Center, they call it. Now, why I ended up in the engineer, I don't know. <laughs> but anyhow, that's where I took my basic training. Five weeks of basic training in Fort Leonard Wood. I learned all about the rifle, firing a <clears throat> rifle. And uh, after five weeks, uh, which finished up that first basic training, he asked me if I wanted to go back to college. You know, I, that was a good question to ask me because I sure did like that. After basic training, I, I said, I'd be glad to go back to college. And, they had a program called ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program. And so I was, uh, I ended up in Washington Jefferson College in Wa uh, Washington, Pennsylvania. And spent 10, uh, that was there in May, and I spent uh, 10, <clears throat> 10 uh, well, let's see, 10 months there, yes. And that finished up the <clears throat> basic part of the course of ASTP. And uh, <clears throat> without further uh, explanation, they shipped us all to the 84th Infantry Division, closed down the Army Specialized Training. And uh, so we went into uh, it was in April, I believe, of 1944 that we were in Camp Claiborne, Louisiana in the 84th Infantry Division. I ended up in a headquarters company, which I learned uh, later on. <clears throat> Sometimes it was a matter of life and death. If you ended up in a rifle company, why, uh, there was a higher chance of getting killed or badly wounded in a rifle company. But anyhow, uh, <clears throat> I had my experiences in an anti-tank platoon in headquarters company. And we had 57 millimeter uh, guns that were <clears throat> firing 57 millimeter shells, which they didn't tell us at the time, but it wouldn't stop a German tank. If it did, it was a lucky hit that would do it. But we did have bazookas, and they turned out to be the more effective weapon. Uh, and uh, after training there, we thought maybe we'd be going to the Pacific. And uh, turned out that they trained us to go to Europe. And in September of 1944, we loaded the guns on the flat cars and uh, we headed for uh, New York and ended up in uh, <clears throat> Camp Kilmer. And we were there just about a month getting ready to uh, go overseas. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things we did on training was climb <clears throat> climb over in a tower, climb over a rail, get on nets and climb down the nets and to jump into a boat. That's the way they figured you had to land. That's what way we had to do it when we got over there. So we loaded, uh, remember the troop ship we loaded on was called the Thomas Berry. And it, it was a, had been converted from a cruise ship to a, troop ship. 
and uh, <clears throat> the trip over was rather uneventful. We were in a big convoy and we were, had a submarine scare, but none of we didn't have any ships sunk at the time. And when we got to uh, the English coast, uh, <clears throat> we our ship was the first one to go into Southampton, which had been practically destroyed by the German bombing, but it had been restored enough for us starting to land there. And so <clears throat> our troop ship pulled into dock. Of course, everybody on board was anxious to see it. This was in the evening, as I remember. And the ship was leaning way over. And uh, on, I said, now hear this over the PA system. Half of you soldiers are gonna have to move on the other side of the ship or we won't be able to dock. So that was the first experience there. Uh, we got off in the morning. Uh, we got off ship, got on English trains. This was, the trains were just like you'd see in the movies, the kind of compartments. And we, this was in southern England. And we were, uh, ended up in a, uh, what was a, more of a, what we call a baron's uh, estate. And it had a big chateau and it had a stable house and uh, a bunch of concert huts had been set up there. And uh, so our regiment was, uh, ended up there. And <clears throat> our platoon of anti-tank platoon uh, was placed in the stable, stable house. But that was the nicest stable I would have been in. We were on the second floor. The <laughs> horses were kept on the lower floor. But the second floor was better than a barracks. It was a delightful place to stay. <clears throat> I, one thing I remember was election year came around at that time. And I could swear that Wilkie was running against Roosevelt. But I can't be sure about that now. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I remembered I didn't vote for Roosevelt. D so you did vote, though. I, we, I had the uh, absentee ballot. I was mm -hmm. able to vote or send it in long before the election, sometime before the election. Uh -huh. And so we were <clears throat> there for, in Southampton area, for uh, a while. <clears throat> uh, several things that I remember we were talking about earlier. We went out, uh, we did some drill work there, and we did this one occasion, uh, the anti-tank platoon went out in a truck to a field where we were going to have some bazooka practice. And on the way there, we passed these big stones that were standing in the field, and I remembered uh, <coughs> high school history, Stonehenge. So this was Stonehenge, and I was able to, I was the only one on the truck that knew that it was a Stonehenge. <laughs> so I was explaining a little bit what Stonehenge was, what little I knew about it. So we got to uh, practice uh, on the practice field for the uh, impaired off. And I happened to pair off with a fellow I didn't know. I learned later that he'd been, had been, before he got in the army, he was in the Georgia chain gang. You don't remember his name, do you? Not now. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, so uh, I was given the bazooka, to t told to lie down and aim the bazooka at a target we had out there. And my part was to, partner was to load the bazooka with the rocket. And the, the rockets at that time had fins on them. Uh, so the instructor said, go ahead and load the rocket. So this my partner loaded the rocket and, and wired it up. And the instructor said, fire. And so I pulled the trigger. Unfortunately, when he had loaded the rocket, the fins hadn't been slid into the tube that hung over the end. And it, all the blast was absorbed by me and the rocket and the tube. And so it just dragged me along the ground. <clears throat> it didn't injure me. It just scraped up my arms and legs a little bit. My, <clears throat> 
I, I don't know why they didn't have a safety feature on it that when you get the rocket loaded, but these were either practice rockets or heavy HE, they called them, and the rocket had no chance of exploding. So I w wasn't injured in any way, but it was an experience that I remembered. Yeah. And we were in, uh, <coughs> so we were able to play softball and some touch football and and while we were in this uh, area place, uh, I went into uh, London on a pass. I got into London with another friend by the name of Bill Roney. And uh, we went into London when the uh, V-2 rockets were being shot by the Germans. The, V2, the V-1s uh, were the slower rocket and uh, the V-2s uh, went into, into the stratosphere, and where they came down, they really didn't know. They had no way of accepting. They were landing in London, and you could never hear one coming. You, you heard the explosions around London, and you just hoped that one wasn't going to be near you. Mm -hmm. So we, <laughs> we experienced some of the war from that aspect. and. <clears throat> so I spent a couple of days in London, and the well, only thing I can remember, I got some fish and chips from London. <laughs> <coughs> the uh, other, well, from then, we ended up uh, going to uh, the, cross the channel on a British ship, smaller ship. And we crossed the channel, and when we got to, we landed at Omaha Beach. That was where the home landing had made on D-Day. Of course, this is several months after, three months after. And that's where we got, took a, bit, a little bit of our training we had in Camp Kilmer. We climbed over the railing and climbed down nets and got into these <coughs> boats. LCDs? And the LCDs, right. They were bobbing up and down an awful lot. And we had full packs on a duffel bag. And so if you missed the boat, you still went to, like some of them did during the invasion, some were actually drowned that way. They, when they had to get into the boats, they, they'd miss the boat and wow. go straight to the bottom with all that equipment on it carrying a rifle beside. Mm. So <clears throat> anyhow, we made it onto the beach and it was a uh, <clears throat> nice time to be going on there. It was very, <laughs> I remember seeing the, some ships that had been sunk out away from the beach that as, acted as a breakwater. So we had no further problem. <clears throat> we ended up, of course, having to that's November well, of 44. Uh, this was uh, more September of 44. Oh, September of 44. Right. It might oh. have been, uh, right, it was in September because we walked about 15, to, I guess it was a good 15 mile hike to a field in France and set up our bivouac there. We slept in tents and uh, all kinds of rumors went around. One of the rumors was they got <coughs> 5,000 white crosses just been received by supply. <laughs> that was a good rumor. It, of course, it was strictly a rumor. <coughs> so <coughs> after spending some time there, we were able to have some uh, touch football games. That was in the fall, and that was a one of the things to do, and I, I think uh, we remember we got together a enlisted man team and we played the uh, officers in a touch football game. <coughs> I don't remember too much about. I think we did beat them, but not sure about that. But I was quarterback. I, I was a good passer. I remember that. <coughs> so the convoy got together and. Uh, we loaded up on two and a half ton trucks and headed for Paris. Uh, 
each truck had a uh, machine gun mounted in the, over the cab. Uh, <coughs> there was right at the front of the truck where the gunner could, because they were still afraid of uh, <coughs> airplane assaults from uh, the Germans, they still had, uh, they'd be out somewhat every day. So we ended up in Paris, and I think this was in, uh, in October. And we went through Paris, I remember seeing the Eiffel Tower, and there were a lot of people lying in the street and they were all clapping and cheering. Made you feel good anyhow. The Parisians were glad to see the American actually. And we passed Le Berger Airport, and uh, <coughs> got into Belgium and it's, uh, it started to get cold. And in fact, it started to rain that evening and we had to pull into a field area and set up tents. And that was no fun because it was <coughs> rather muddy and it was raining and trying to put a pup tent up in the rain is no fun in itself. <coughs> Before we had gotten, uh, or no, it was after we were there over, overnight, and then we had our uh, kitchen had set up. We had uh, <coughs> a breakfast and then set out for uh, Belgium. And I remember at that time we spotted our first uh, V1 rockets. It reminded you of a emergent heater, sounded like an emergent heater running in a big tank at the mess hall. It was a rumble to it. And you see, and here come the rocket, it was in plain sight, going around, it seemed like pretty slow. Everything was all right until the motor cut out. And then it just nosed in toward the ground and came down immediately, and that's the explosion. <clears throat> Fortunately, and none of those came down near us. Some, when they got farther down, maybe you could still hear a, mm -hmm. the explosion where they were hitting. Mm -hmm. They had no idea really where those were going to go. They were just, uh, <clears throat> well, they say annoying. They were very annoying. <clears throat> so it, we drove uh, all night. I remember, it was got cold. And they, of course, they'd put the tops up on the two and a half ton trucks, and we got into Holland. And this was uh, up near Aachen, Germany. That's where the front line was. And we could hear uh, artillery explosions in the distance. And we stopped in, in a small town, I remember the name of Mechelen, Holland. And we stayed there for several days, and at the time we were there, well, the Dutch people would invite us to uh, have lunch with them, or uh, one occasion we stayed overnight in one of their, one of the house. They were very friendly to us. And uh, <coughs> anything to keep from staying outside, if you could help that, or if you could avoid it. <coughs> After uh, being there for maybe a week, as I remember. This was uh, actually in November. We'd gotten up to Mechlin. And we, we were in Mechlin about the first week. Or anyhow, it was about the early in November when we <coughs> got word we were going to move up to the, move into the line, so called. At the time, it was. And we actually uh, drove into this town, a German small town, but it had some nice, very nice homes in it. I remember we pulled in and we could hear the artillery going off and it was uh, late in the evening as I remember. And we, <coughs> we were in our own truck at that time. We'd received our own trucks, own equipment and uh, <coughs> we pulled into this one house in the yard 
and we got out. <clears throat> a jeep pulled up just when a barrage, apparently, the Germans cut loose on it. it was a, probably a mortar barrage. And a mortar shell lit very close to us and darn near, uh, well, it hit the driver's in his leg and he was starting to get out of the jeep and his leg was uh, just dangling there. So I ran out and, and got him out and took him next door because there was a medic next door to us fortunately and so I got him in there and uh, <coughs> I didn't stay any there I went back over where our squad was never did uh, hear him I'm sure I know he had to go to a hospital so that was the first injury that we <laughs> experienced <coughs> by this time we were so close here a lot of machine gun here machine guns going off and the German machine gun was uh, a lot, you could always tell the difference between ours and theirs. Uh, theirs was a very s fast staccato, da 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 da, and ours was slower. Uh, <coughs> you learn these things after a while. You learn how uh, when shells were coming in, whether they were going to land close or not. Of course, they were going to land real close, so you didn't live to <laughs> experience it. Uh, <coughs> And uh, well, these were our first experiences going into. I remember I spent a night and had to dig a small or shallow hole, <coughs> not a foxhole, just a, like a trench, and lying there in the trench and hear this German plane it was, it flew over every night, came by. Bed check Charlie, as we call him, and uh, or beg bed check Fritz via Charlie. Anyhow, these were the early days of going into combat. Uh, the first operation occurred. Uh, we were given instructions. They always told you you had to have information about what the <coughs> the goal was mm -hmm. in the attack and how the attack was going to go and we were and the whole regiment was to take uh, Geilenkirchen that was a pretty good sized city uh, maybe 30 miles from Aachen and Aachen had just been captured <coughs> and the, there were towns around uh, in that area. Uh, uh, German had a lot of towns similar to this. They'd have a church, it'd be a church steeple in the middle of town. Then the people were settled around the church and it was a, a small town in itself. And uh, <coughs> the people owned farmland around and they we would be working out on the farms and come in in the evening and settle in their homes. Their homes included the stables. So it wasn't unusual to have a horse and a cow that might be <coughs> looking in on you in the, at the kitchen. Well, we learned that from <laughs> later on. Anyhow, Prummern was the name of the town that we were to capture. And uh, <clears throat> so our truck, we had, of course, anti-tank gun. We rode in the truck and across this large field, started out in the morning. And uh, all I can remember was we had to jump off and the truck would have to stop. We'd jump off because shells would come in. Fortunately, none hit the truck. <clears throat> we climbed back in and, and proceed and finally on the way, we saw a number of uh, rifles that were stuck into the ground and a body lying next to it. And it had been a rifleman had been hit, or, <coughs> and the, and the helmet was put on the rifle. And they were casualties uh, going all the way on this field to get into Prummer. So we made it into Prummer, 
and then stopped at an intersection, I remember. It's just a small town. But, and, and looked down the street, about maybe six blocks away, there was a German tank, and his gun was aimed right at us. So we all bailed out. And the, the shell, fortunately, was overhead, went overhead, didn't hit the truck. And, uh, and fortunately, the tank retreated immediately. And, <laughs> which was a good thing because we had a mighty hard time con uh, combating it. <clears throat> so then we went on to uh, found that we had three squads in our platoon. The, the other squad had gotten to the edge of town and it, uh, there was a shell that had hit near the truck and had killed one of the fellows that I knew on the, in that platoon and injured a couple of others. And we pulled on past the truck and uh, set up our gun <coughs> in the field. And uh, all we could do was get the gun set up. We had to open up the trails. And then, fortunately, there were some holes. Apparently, the Germans had uh, dug some foxholes there because we dove into them because we had shells that were li landing all around us. These were 88, <coughs> which we learned was the German, the, pr the prime German gun. It was not only flat trajectory, but it <coughs> actually could be used for anti-aircraft too. Yeah. Very good gun, there wasn't any question about it. And we learned that the Germans usually had intersections <coughs> zeroed in. <coughs> so that was our first day. Uh, fortunately, we were <coughs> in the uh, foxhole overnight. And the, the firing let up. I can't remember too much about the exact things happening then. That was too far back. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, we moved into a house uh, and half the roof was blown off. And we, there was a, <coughs> this was actually in the Siegfried line, the village where the line, the Siegfried line ran right through there. Because the basement uh, in that house <coughs> was like a bomb shelter. It had a, <coughs> a sealed door and concrete sides. And we went in there and spent the evening in there, I remember, and shut that door. And it was pitch dark, naturally. And somebody, I remember I was half asleep, somebody was trying to light a match and they couldn't light it. I said, well, I got, we haven't got any oxygen in here. <laughs> so we wised up and opened the door. <coughs> and, uh, but we were in that area for maybe a week. I remember it was kind of a hot spot. Uh, in the, <coughs> during the day, we'd go out and we went out on a patrol on several occasions. One of the things that I had was a, my weapon as a gunner on a 57 millimeter was a pistol, a 45 millimeter pistol, which I wasn't real good, uh, real accurate with. Uh, anyhow, we went out on patrol to go after some Germans that had infiltrated back into town. And so you'd creep along and uh, <coughs> the only way you'd find out they were there is when they shot at you. And fortunately, uh, they'd usually be in town overnight and then retreat. And we got to this one area, an open area in a courtyard. There were foxholes there, and every foxhole had an M1 in it. It had been captured. These, uh, I learned later that this platoon a tank, it might have been the same tank that had shot at us, came up on them and the machine, had a machine gunner that threatened to 
shoot them all. They couldn't, so they were there without any armor, so they had to give up. Well, that's where I got my M1. <laughs> I picked it and I carried it through the rest of the war, <coughs> which uh, I was glad to get. Uh, <coughs> I, uh, trying to think some of the other things that were going on, we had, uh, being in the Siegfried line, it was tough. They were, every time they tried to advance, they were stopped by these pillboxes. And the pillboxes had machine guns in them. And uh, <coughs> I think uh, so this was getting toward the end of uh, November, getting into early part of December. We moved around in several different places. I couldn't remember now exactly. It was too far back. Anyhow, <coughs> we thought, they said it was, a, it turned out to be the 14th of December. But we were pulled back and said we were going back. And so we got into a convoy. And that was, uh, must have been in the night of the 14th or the 15th. It was when the Germans were, had broken through down in Belgium. We didn't know this. They never tell you where you're going, of course. <coughs> and we're running at night with cat eyes over. And which is just slits in the headlights. So <coughs> you had to be careful driving in, in, in that dark. It was a convoy. And we, uh, got into, we went through Liège, Belgium, and got to a city called Marche in Belgium. And that's when we learned that there's nobody between us and the Germans. That was a favorite thing to say was that that can't be, but it, that was a fact because Bastogne, at the time we didn't know about Bastogne, but it was about 10 miles uh, east of us, and we were in Marche, maybe it was 15 miles. And we were billeted in a schoolhouse when we got there. It, was, it wasn't bad because it, it was darn cold on the 15th of December. Wasn't any snow at that time. And uh, the next day we went out to the uh, edge of town and set up a gun looking down this road and said, the Germans may be coming at any time. And uh, fortunately, they didn't come that day. And we, uh, <coughs> in the next couple of days, moved to a town called um, Marin. And uh, Verdun, there was a small town. And we passed through Verdun and went to Marin, and it was a another small town in Belgium and we set up the gun at, at the edge of town right up uh, going up the hill and it was, it was a stone farmhouse very nice we built two-story farmhouse and so <coughs> we had to set up there and uh, very little was known of about where the Germans were. And you couldn't, uh, I know we had a, an attic and a uh, field observer for, for artillery came and uh, we went up in the attic and, and he was looking over in the woods and there well, we saw some German tanks in the woods. This must have been, must have a mile and a half, two miles away. It was darn close. And, uh, so he called in some artillery on them, and they were out in the open. They drew, the tanks went back in the woods, and uh, so we knew how close it was. It was a situation where <coughs> if you wanted to retreat, you wouldn't know which way to go. <laughs> it was kind of, everything was kind of chaotic. But we had our guns set up in the, uh, in the garden. And uh, 
I remember we, that we went to the second floor and the, this elderly couple that lived in the house said, please don't uh, disturb the bed. It's an old antique bed that's up there. We don't mind your staying there, of course. So we, uh, we decided to sleep up there with, with a couple of us down on guard. And uh, that night, the, there was a, an attack into Verdun. The Germans came in. Our artillery was firing in there. Uh, <coughs> the next day, a German tank came across the field and, and fired and hit the uh, wall, uh, the bedroom wall, and blew a hole in it. And, uh, <coughs> all that debris went all over the bed. <laughs> we didn't sleep in it, so <laughs> we messed the bed up. That's what happened. So, anyhow, <coughs> the, uh, that I remember that night. It was the day after on Christmas Day. We uh, didn't experience any activity except one thing. I saw these three P-38 uh, airplanes come diving in uh, over a hill that was off uh, looking out at it. And uh, they went in and bombed, dropped a bomb in straight. And two of them made it away. And when the third one came in, when he got up so high, he was hit by anti-aircraft and nosed over and went into the ground and, and blew up. And I, I thought to myself, uh, there's a family that's going to get some bad news. It just, of course, killed the pilot. They couldn't yeah. get out. <clears throat> but it was good to see. That was the first day that uh, Air Corps had really gotten into the air much because of the uh, weather. bad weather and the snow. We were getting snow then. And uh, we caught a couple of chickens. And I remember that. That was. Christmas Day, and uh, had a fire, and we, we had fried chicken that Christmas because we didn't we had nothing but K rations otherwise, so that was a treat to get that. But that night, I know we were <coughs> sitting in the living room of the house. It was dark, and we could hear this uh, rumble of tanks. We said, by golly, we haven't seen a tank since we've been here, a Sherman tank. But they don't sound like Shermans. So we finally figured they're German tanks. And that crew, uh, the ones we'd seen over in the woods, <coughs> were in a convoy and they started up the hill toward our house. And uh, we grabbed a, a bazooka and the, my buddy, who had been uh, <coughs> actually just joined us, he was a replacement, and we were cut down to about four people in our squad. And uh, he grabbed the bazooka, and I grabbed the rocket, not paying much attention to whether it was AK or <coughs> or uh, AK, yeah. and it, whether it was a high explosive or armor piercing. Turned out it was HE. Mm -hmm. Was we were crouched down in, at the front doorway of the house, and there was a iron gate right next to the road, and one one part of the gate was open, the other was closed. <coughs> and so I loaded the uh, rocket, and he pulled the trigger, but the was on sand. He didn't know anything about it. I don't think he had any training in firing a rocket. Anyhow, <coughs> anyhow, we put the safety on, and when the tank got abreast of us, he fired, but he hit the gate. Uh, didn't make it through the opening. He hit the gate, and the, the rocket was HE, and it blew up right in front of us. It was singed, singed our eyebrows. 
<coughs> one of the things that happened. And, but anyhow, we loaded another rocket, and I loaded, uh, I don't remember, I checked to make sure it was armor piercing. And he ran out into the road, <coughs> and the tank was at the top of the hill, and he and stopped, and he was going to shoot at it. If he had shot it from the rear, it would have done damage. But I yelled at him because I saw the muzzle of a second tank coming around that curve. There's nothing like it. looked like it was about 60 foot long. You know, the muzzle of a tank, <laughs> it exaggerates in your imagination. Right. <laughs> so I yelled at him to get back here because another tank was coming. And so <clears throat> this tank came up and uh, so many things go through your mind. I said, <clears throat> if the commander of the tank had been, had his head stuck out through the, the tower they have on tanks or <clears throat> sometimes they when they're driving around they'll do that they'll be open and have their heads stuck if he had his head stuck out he would have seen us and would have machine gunned us I think the Lord was in our favor because he was buttoned up he didn't see us and uh, <clears throat> he got off of, uh, hit the side of the tank with that HE <clears throat> and my Pierced that armor, I don't know, but the tank kept on going. And then there were about five or six tanks, and I think, as I recall, he hit every one of them and didn't stop a one of them, and which is really uh, in our favor. Looking back, <clears throat> because after the five or six tanks, or maybe it was more, went by, here came a uh, personnel carrier with half-track, half and German soldiers were running along beside it. That was when we hit the door, went through the hall, and out the back door. <laughs> Got out of there. <coughs> and there was uh, artillery fire coming in, and because our own artillery uh, had been called in, and uh, it was very chaotic, that's all I can remember. And we ended up starting into the woods, and the artillery is coming into the woods. So we came, had to come back and go into this farmhouse. And we spent the night in that farmhouse, wondering whether the Germans had taken the town or what was happening. We didn't see anything till the next morning. I looking out, I saw. <coughs> Uh, a crew, there was a one uh, anti-tank uh, person, a carrier in the town and they were parked in a barn and I remember seeing the one member of that crew walking down the street. That was the best sight imaginable. <clears throat> so we all left the house and went back into town. It so it happened that that convoy, the Germans, they were actually trying, I guess, trying to get back into Germany because they <coughs> got into the next town and ran into a, a chain uh, of mines, a mine chain that blew up a, a, one of the <coughs> tanks, disabled one of the tanks. And then the artillery came in and just knocked, uh, just uh, practically destroyed the whole convoy. Hmm. And uh, if that convoy had been held up or stopped uh, for any reason, if we had stopped the tank, why uh, they <coughs> would probably have killed us or captured us because we were outmanned by a long shot. We had five people, five men. What town was that again? This was in uh, Marin. Marin. Marin, Belgium. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the other town down the road was uh, Verdun. And we learned later that uh, 
and the K Company of 333rd had run into Germans and they fought them in that chateau on uh, Christmas, oh, <coughs> Christmas uh, Eve. You learn a lot about the things after they've happened. Mm -hmm. And so we <coughs> did move into Verdun after that day, and uh, <coughs> when we didn't have any more contact with the, the Germans, they fired some artillery in on us. But uh, I remember it was getting very cold, when it was getting down, uh, felt like it was down around zero, and there was, there was snow. Um, <coughs> we didn't get encounter, we were had kind of a time off, so that we didn't encounter any more German. We were, uh, we were listening, we were housed in a, a Belgium farmhouse, and uh, I remember they asked me to, if I wanted to volunteer to join the communications platoon. You know how you're asked as a volunteer. <laughs> so I, I said, "Well, I knew ones in the communications platoon, and so sure, I went, in, went ahead and joined them. And they <coughs> they taught me how to splice wire, gave me a two-hour session on some of the things they had to do in communications, but they didn't tell me about carrying a reel of wire." That's what I ended up having to do. Another fellow and myself had a rod through the reel. I don't know. Felt like it weighed uh, at least a hundred pounds and fifty pounds <laughs> apiece. And the uh, this was for an attack on on Bejo, Germany, which was the edge of uh, Belgium, and it was driving the Germans out of Belgium. And this attack started in the morning. We, we <coughs> had all this time, had never gotten any white uniforms, like to cover your regular uniform in the snow. Right. And we were given <coughs> white to put on. And we put on, and uh <coughs> so that was a big help. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, we were with the battalion commander. He wanted to have communication with him all the time. So we were had the wire, direct wire, because you couldn't rely on radio. It was too, too frequent times when you were with walkie-talkies and SCR 300, they call them, radios that wouldn't work or you couldn't get through. So he... He wanted that <coughs> communications with him all the time. So we spent the day going through snow drifts, dragging a real a wire. <coughs> there was a jeep that followed us with the wire. When we'd run out of one reel, we'd have to go back to the jeep and get the, another. Oh, it was interesting. and. Uh, we got to the end of the day. It was just like a day's work. Only we <laughs> started out early in the morning and finished up supper time. And they, we got on a railroad embankment and watched a barrage that went in before the attack on the town of Bejo. So it was pretty easily done. There weren't many Germans left in the town. They <coughs> they'd retreated. And uh, so we got into town, uh, and then we set up a communication squad set up in a church there. And I was unloading the jeep. We had uh, our packs were brought up <coughs> so we could uh, have something with us. Uh, and I heard this shells coming in. Turned out they were 88 millimeter that were being fired in. They 
they landed in the yard right next to us in this and two fellows were there that I knew very well, close friends. One of them was killed, the other was badly wounded because the Germans were shooting back into town. Yeah. <coughs> uh, that was, we had no other experiences in the Bejo that finished the operation. That was when we uh, moved back up north and the <coughs> that concluded the bulge for us and moved back up north to the Roar, uh, <coughs> near the Roar River, and that's where we set up to uh, cross the, Roar, the flooded Roar and uh, move on to the Rhine. And that picture that was taken was taken by <coughs> a French photographer, I this remember. This picture right here? That's the picture. We were carrying assault boats that we had to use to cross the Roar. And I happen to be in the front there on the... Where are you located on this picture? Uh, I was in this very left soldier, GI, and the boats were mighty heavy. We had uh, bazookas with us. That's the reason we were going across the river, because any, we couldn't, <coughs> wouldn't be able to get tanks across, so we got a bridge across. So that was the only picture that I had taken in action. Uh, so we uh, made it across the river all right. There were several boats were caught in the middle of the river by a machine gun and practically all of them were killed that were in the boats because they hadn't knocked out that one machine gun. But they had a tremendous artillery barrage across the river and uh, <coughs> one th th after that the war changed a little bit of course for the early times before we'd gone down to the bulge we'd been fighting in the <coughs> in that town and you'd go out and you'd it was actually almost like World War they'd be digging foxholes and and moving uh, maybe a hundred yards, and uh, that's about the way it was going. It was just <coughs> very slow going and a lot of fatalities. So after getting across the Ruhr River, we lined up in convoys and climbed up on tanks and rode on the tanks. Oh, we were in the trucks, 57 millimeter gun. And so it, it was a case of uh, moving pretty fast, and then you'd run into a roadblock and you'd stop. And I remember at night we did that and ran up and you'd be stopped, be sitting there, and you wouldn't hear, you might hear some firing going on up ahead. And it was very quiet, and then it, off in the distance <laughs> you hear this bonk, 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 and that was a mortar being dropped in a tube in fired. And so we knew the mortars were zeroing in on our convoy and, and this so we <coughs> when we heard those bonks we jumped off the truck. That's when one of the fellows on our truck was killed and a couple were wounded. Fortunately I not I <coughs> <coughs> And uh, <coughs> I might have to get a drink of water. Mm -hmm. uh, we're back. Um, <coughs> and you were talking about the mortars when you hear the bonk, bonk, bonk. And right. One of your uh, men and got killed and another one wounded, I think. You knew when that was, you heard the bonk, they were going to land fairly close, and they did. <coughs> and uh, that was during the night, this particular time. This was on the way to the uh, Rhine River, and we <coughs> got to cities. Uh, Krefeld was one that I remember, and Munchen, Gladbach. Those were cities that we 
uh, took and went through because the Germans were retreating fast. And the <coughs> they had actually, uh, that's when the Ray Morgan uh, Bridge uh, was taken as the only bridge that hadn't been destroyed. <coughs> and that was, we were north of that. We uh, landed on, uh, we ended up in uh, across the river, Rhine River from Duisburg, D-U-I-S-B-E-R-G, Duisburg. How did you get across the river? <coughs> we, we didn't cross. Uh, we were on the other, on the side of the, uh, <coughs> on the west side of the river. And we moved into this town that was right across from Duisburg. And that's where we sat for about two weeks. It was around Easter time, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And uh, we could see the Germans across the river. And we were instructed to set the gun up on the dike at, on our side of the river. And this was a sunny afternoon, I remember. And we were digging in on the dike. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> we, uh, I saw, heard this, uh, these bullets were hitting this building right behind us. And I realized there was a gun across the river that was shooting at us. Uh, we didn't see, hadn't seen it. It was an anti-aircraft gun. <coughs> Fortunately, he started out uh, aimed too high, or we'd have been, I wouldn't be here. Uh, we dove down behind the dike <coughs> and called in artillery, and they. Uh, <coughs> That caused them to get leave the gun, go off of it, and we fired our gun and knocked out their anti-aircraft gun. Then, but uh, that was uh, again the Lord was with me. <laughs> there always many occasions that I felt that because I escaped without. <clears throat> never did have to go on sick call till later on. <clears throat> well, uh, there was one instance when I was in Camp Claiborne, I'll go back to this, because it, I had to go on sick call for a toothache. And when I got to the barracks where the uh, dental office was, <coughs> I was called upstairs. They had booze lining the side of the wall, it must have been ten, five on each side. And there was a dentist in each one. So I went in there and sat down, and this young blue cycle lieutenant, I figured he probably had just maybe graduated. <coughs> so the colonel was heading, headed up the uh, dental uh, affair, and uh, he's, he uh, just had the dentist go ahead, and I told him what tooth it was, and so he uh, drilled it, put in a <coughs> and uh, put in a filling, and I started to get up, and he said, hold on, had to call the colonel over for inspection. <coughs> and the colonel inspected, you don't call that a proper filling, do you? <laughs> He's referring to the second lieutenant. <laughs> Take that out and put it in right. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> Well, you know, the second lieutenant wasn't very happy. <coughs> and uh, he finally, finally went through all that and got the approval and left. Man, alive. And, well, I figured that tooth probably was the one that started to bother me when I was ready to come home. <coughs> well, anyhow, I, that's the reason I went back to that. But... Uh, <coughs> and see where we were as far as uh, you're on the west side of the Rhine and, and uh, artillery has been called in yes and uh, <clears throat> we took care of that situation and we were set up there for, we were in apartment houses on the Rhine River and the lights were still on an electric light. is that at Duisburg and Duisburg was right across I can't remember the name of the city right now that we were in across from Duisburg okay of course, the bridge there was blown, and Ray Morgan had been uh, 
captured and, and started across down there. <coughs> and uh, there was one thing, there was a barge right across from where we were, and there were German snipers that were getting into the barge. And so we called in for air support. And I remember these P-47s, they were rough airplanes. <laughs> came in and just the idea of having one coming at you, uh, but firing at you, that was, right. and that was what we saw. And they then they went on this as a barge, and uh, if there were any Germans there, they left or were dead. <coughs> they strafed it pretty good. Um, but then it was, we had Easter service, uh, and it was a nice sunny morning, I remember that and uh, on the Rhine River. And there was a movie that had come out earlier, Watch on the Rhine. Right. I remembered that. Remember that? Here we I am on the Rhine River. So we headed north and ended up in W-E-S-E-L, Wesel. There had been a, mm -hmm. <coughs> a uh, crossing there at Wesel, and uh, they had uh, gliders that went in Cross and landed beyond at the edge of the town to help take the town and for the crossing. And we saw those gliders. That some of them were pretty well crashed up. They always come in. <coughs> Took a lot of guts to go in a glider. It's being pulled and cut loose, and you, right. and you come in. Try to find a landing spot. Right. And so that was, we started our, uh, crossing on the autobahns. That was the modern highways that Hitler built for his purposes, and so it ended up that we traveled fast all the way to <coughs> through going through, remember Karlsruhe was the big city that we took, and I remember passing a jail that was full of prisoners that were anxious to get out. I mean, they were political prisoners. It wasn't a concentration camp, but it was like that. And there, <coughs> there was one concentration camp that we took, or a division, the Salzwedel, near Hanover. Uh, fortunately, I look at it that way, I, I didn't see any of the concentration camps. The ones that saw them, uh, we tend to get, uh, hard to forget. I mean, it just, well, terrible. And uh, we ended up on the <coughs> Elbe River, uh, the Russians were coming from the other side, and we got to the Elbe River long before they got to Berlin. <coughs> and I remember we thought that we would be crossing the Elbe. At this time, the Germans were trying like crazy to give up. In fact, it was kind of interesting. We set our guns up at a, uh, in a German <coughs> farmhouse, right, it was <coughs> right close to the hill, we could see in the couple of hundred yards away. <coughs> and we were just used, not, uh, I remember we were out there having had to set up the guns and Russian fighter planes came over. And uh, <coughs> I remember I could see the Russian pilot, he waved at us. And of course, at that time, we thought the Russians were real allies. And do you remember the name of the town there? Or well, village? Back, I think it was a, it was a near. We were near, we were out in the country, Magdeburg, I believe it was uh, Magde Magdeburg. Magdeburg mm -hmm. I believe was uh, near there, and it was a city on the Elbe, and. Uh, <coughs> We we had the guns set up there, but the little in activity. And we were in the a farmhouse uh, where the laborers would live, and we were cooking a supper. We, there was about six of us in there, and uh, the, the sergeant, the platoon sergeant, came. All that time, we didn't have an officer in the platoon. We had this platoon sergeant that took care of everything. He came, came into the door and he said, uh, 
well, who's out there on the gun? Uh, and so we looked at each other, and went, well, we're all in here. Well, there are two guys out on the gun. We went out there, two Germans sitting on the gun. <laughs> they were wanting to give up. <laughs> so that was the way things ended up. And we had to sit there, and uh, it was a political deal, you know, when they said, let the Russians take Berlin. So, uh, and the war was over for us at that time. And uh, just to get on with the time, and we were in occupation. We thought we might be pulled back because but they put, uh, we put us in occupation. Well, the division that had to go to the Far East got back into the States. The war ended, and they were, got out quickly. We were <laughs> on occupation, so we stayed over. And, uh, well, that's when I got on the regimental baseball team and spent the summer. I spent the summer in Karlsruhe, Germany. We played baseball games in soccer fields. And, and uh, <coughs> Got, and our points, I had enough points to come, be uh, sent out with a, another bunch of us, a good friend of mine, lived in Elmira, New York. We went, ended up in Reims, uh, France. And we were there for, uh, I remember I played on the basketball team in Reims, France. And uh, <coughs> we were in charge of picking up POWs uh, from a POW, German prisoners, so they come back and be janitorial work for where the billets were in, in Reims. And uh, so I remember I, uh, while I was there, I was, <coughs> I could type, so I was working as a clerk in the Little Red Schoolhouse. That's where the peace treaty was signed. In fact, it was right down the hall from the room that I was in. And uh, <coughs> that's where the uh, uh, Germans and the Eisenhower, and all, they sat and signed the treaty, Little Red Schoolhouse. Uh, <coughs> and, so that I, was, and that was how close to you? Well, it was in Reims, right in Reims, the city mm -hmm. of Reims. And <clears throat> then I got on with a sign to a company, that's the way you had got back, a company that was being returned, I had enough points. Uh, La Harve was uh, the cigarette camp, Lucky Strike, Lucky Strike cigarette camp. They named them all after, that's another thing the Army did was promoted cigarettes for sure. K-rations had cigarettes in them. All these camps for returning veterans were called for Chesterfield, Old Gold, Lucky Strike. I think I was in Lucky Strike. And so it was this time that, um, that I was still in Reims that I <coughs> woke up with a fever and uh, with a, that tooth was bothering me. So I went, my mistake was going to the dentist. And so the dentist there of course, he's in the army. He's getting ready to go home himself. Anyhow, he he, he should have pulled the tooth. He just filled it. <coughs> and uh, later on, I was eating some caramel corn, and the filling broke. Well, the last thing I was going to do was go to the dentist again before. So I got on the boat. The boat was the Cease Camp. Was the name of the boat. And uh, when I got on the boat, I got on the ship's newspaper, and so I'd stay off duty. <coughs> and so the, <coughs> I was uh, <coughs> a one of the, actually I'd been a sports writer for my college paper. So I, we're sitting there, our first meeting, and a master sergeant had been named the editor, and there was about four others of us that were on the paper. And he said, I'm going to write an editorial, the first thing about Mal the Mayor, about seasickness. 
and then we were in the ship's library, and that library had one porthole, and the ship was really rolling. And you'd see the sea, and then you'd see the sky. And he wasn't there five minutes, and he got up and rushed for the door. That was the editor of the paper. I never saw him again. <laughs> he was sick. <laughs> we're going to take a break right here just for a second, if you would. Hi, this is Brian Powers, and um, we're picking up this, uh, the rest of this interview without Ray Hughes, who had to leave. And so, if you wouldn't mind picking up from when your guy got seasick. Yes, that was the uh, editor of the newspaper left because <coughs> he had suddenly become seasick and uh, I never saw him the rest of the trip. So we, there were two or three of us that uh, handled all the newspaper and I still have copies of that with me now. Uh, anyhow, <coughs> we, uh, after two or three days out, I began to have a problem with that tooth again, and uh, <coughs> I had a fever, so I put, went on sick call. These are the only sick calls that I made while I was in the Army. And uh, <coughs> so I went up uh, to this cabin where the, there were three dentists, I think the Army and Navy and Air Force. And they were the dental people who were returning home also. So I was in line, so I, when I got up to go in and sit down with this Air Force uh, lieutenant said, you're the next and I'm not going to take you. And so I seated myself and he, I, I told him I'd had a fever and looked at it and he said, I would get you, we've got to pull that. Well, that's what happened. So <clears throat> he pulled the tooth and he, they gave me uh, an antibiotic and put me in sick bay. So I spent the night in sick bay and they, I remember one thing, they wake me up to give me a pill to sleep. <laughs> so anyhow, I got some sleep and uh, the next day I heard coming over the PA system my name was being called Page. They wondered where I was for the newspaper. <clears throat> so I finally got word to them. And I, well, I was able to get out right after that <clears throat> and served on the newspaper the rest of the way home. And we landed in New York and I went to Indian Town Gap to get out of the, <clears throat> of the Army. That was uh, in March of uh, mid March. I didn't remember the exact day. This is March of uh, 46. In March of 46, 1946. So I got home at that time and uh, <clears throat> I went back to college that fall. And that's when I met my wife to be. She was a freshman just coming into. College, at Hanover College, and uh, <clears throat> I was uh, well. A, a case of my having been delayed about three years, and uh, that that enabled me to meet her. And the Lord, I felt, brought us together. And Margaret was her name. Do you she remember? Lived in South did you Bend, meet? Indiana. You met on campus. We met on campus. Oh yeah. Do you remember that day? <clears throat> well, I can't remember the day, of course, but uh, this was, uh, <clears throat> as I remember, uh, it was in September in 1946. And uh, I met her on a blind, uh, actually, a friend of mine in the fraternity uh, his girlfriend, they were both Phi Mu sorority people, and uh, she was being rushed, Margaret was being rushed by the Phi Mu fraternity the sorority. And so we went out on a, what occurred to be a blind date. That was my first 
uh, meeting Margaret. And so <coughs> I uh, continued that relationship. I got very, <coughs> and I gave her my pen. I remember that next spring, which is a way of engagement. And uh, we ended up uh, being married the week after I graduated, which was 1948. <coughs> and uh, moved, uh, lived in Batavia, Ohio, and I originally got a position in the bank where my grandfather was president of the bank, so it made an opening for me. What, what had you studied in college? I was uh, in business administration, that's how I might be Bachelor of Arts. And I learned in a, within a year that I was not made out for the bank. <laughs> I didn't care for it too much. At that time, my, gr and my father was manager of Carroll Jameson Machine Tool Company, which is <coughs> actually started by my grandfather in 1903 and had been making engine lays, metalworking engine lays, uh, all during World War II. They were very busy with that, and he, and he was general manager of it. And he really needed help. I know it sounds like it's an easy thing when you have a father and a grandfather, you go in to that business. That's the way it worked. They needed an engineer. And I, I had not <coughs> graduated and taken a lot of engineering, uh, a lot of it in the Army, in the ASPP. <coughs> so I went in as assistant manager to him and as the engineer who was, and the lathe had not been redesigned at all from the time, from the, actually uh, during the 30s. Uh, so I went to work and did uh, working at the redesign of it. And it worked out well because we were, <coughs> uh, this was in 19, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. 1950, I was in the, uh, <coughs> joined the National Guard. And I, well actually it was 1948 that I joined the National Guard. I went in as a supply sergeant of the Guard and uh, <coughs> they asked me if I wanted to be a lieutenant and I said, because I was a combat uh, infantryman and I was a college graduate and it qualified me for a commission in the infantry. And so I'm a second lieutenant like that. And uh, the in another year, along comes the Korean War. Uh, we're married. Uh, <coughs> they. 37th Division was the Ohio Division, and we were federalized, and all shipped had to go to Louisiana again for training. But I had to go to Fort Benning first because for officers, re a refresher course. And I had never had a course, so that was uh, three, three months at Fort Benning. And uh, my wife joined me down there. In the meantime, we had a child. That was my first <coughs> child, a young a baby girl, Beth. And uh, <coughs> after being in down in for a year and a half in Louisiana, I fortunately didn't have to go to Korea. I missed out on that one. So. <coughs> came back to Batavia, uh, found a home to, that they were just building, ranch style, two bedroom with the basement, 
and uh, I think at that time I bought the home for ten thousand dollars, ten thousand five hundred dollars, <coughs> which was fine for a while. After uh, I had another child, and happened to be a boy, and. Uh, <coughs> decided that they were going to have to move, and we had two bedrooms, and they'd either have to move or add on. So I add on, <coughs> made the decision to add on, and so had to spend another 17000 to add on. And But it was well worth it because <coughs> in the home, that's where all my children grew up and uh, had two girls and a boy. They grew up, went to school in Batavia. And when I sold my home, uh, it was e very easy to sell. <coughs> that was in uh, 2005. So you had that house that whole time? Had the house for 48 years. I remember. <coughs> and uh, at that time, and, well, was, of course, my wife passed away in 1946. Uh, we've been married for 48 years. Oh, wait, you said 1946. You mean 1996? 1996. 1996. Yeah, keep up with with the day, with the years. In 96, my wife had passed away, and uh, <coughs> I met this lady from Kentucky who, uh, whose husband had passed away a number of years prior to that. So in 1947... <coughs> 90, 19, 97. <laughs> 97. <laughs> <laughs> it was 1997 <laughs> that uh, we were married. It was a year after my wife had passed away. So, anyhow, I feel that again the Lord provided, brought us together. It's been she's been a wonderful help for me and and I and for her. Fortunately, it was a great relationship. Did any your did any of your kids uh, go uh, into the banking business or into the military? <coughs> My youngest daughter went to ROTC in Cincinnati and became a second lieutenant and was in the Army for 10 to 11 years. And she ended up in Denver, Colorado. And uh, she had had experience with uh, bomb sniffing dogs while she was in the military. And the uh, position opened up. Well, for a couple of years, she was security officer for University of Denver. But then this position opened up for uh, supervisor of bomb sniffing dogs in three airports. Yeah, Denver. Oh, Juanita, this is Brian. Nice to meet you. Oh, we're in the middle of the <laughs> Yeah, we're still taping. We're still on. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, <coughs> we, uh, she is the uh, one that did take up the military and ended well, up. And well, she, that's now, she's still there. What about banking? Anyone get into that? No one, no one <laughs> banking. Uh, my uh, oldest daughter, Beth, uh, is married to a physician, lives in Milford, and she, they were both graduates of Ohio State. And uh, my boy was, uh, ended up as a purchasing manager and been with several different companies, and he's still now working with Rotex had to make a couple of trips to England to their factory over there to get them straightened out on inventory. Uh, 
So uh, I think it's pretty well bringing me up to date. Except um, about your time as mayor of Batavia, how did uh, that come about? Batavia, <coughs> living in Batavia, Ohio, and uh, in 1956, uh, I was talked into running for council. So I became on, I came on Batavia Council, and uh, during that time uh, I was appointed to the, or elected by the other members of the council as vice mayor, and I didn't really even thought much about it, and uh, so happened that the mayor, who'd been mayor for or near 10 years, I guess. He ran for a county position, county clerk, or county auditor, I think it was, and he was elected. And so he left the mayor's position and I was had to take over. And uh, that was in 1959. And uh, my first uh, obligation was mayor's court which I had to have, <coughs> at that time, the mayor's court and the county seat uh, handled the cases of highway patrol or sheriff's deputies on arrests that are made anywhere in the county. They'd oftentimes bring them into mayor's court. And so all during that year, 1959, <coughs> I had court about three times a week and I said, if I'm have to do that anymore, I'm not running for office again in 1959 in November. Well, it happened that the legislator, legislature <coughs> changed the law and said the mayor's court in the county seat would be like any other village. They could only <coughs> had authority in the village only, couldn't handle cases outside. So that was, uh, that relieved me uh, a lot. And so I decided to run. And I must have done a good enough job to get elect, reelected. And I, <coughs> for enough times, and I was in there for 17 years. And eight of those years, I was talked into running for the school board. And I did that for eight years. I don't know, I was a glutton for kind of punishment of <laughs> why I did that. But I learned a lot about both positions. <clears throat> How long did you continue to be in uh, public service? Well, after <clears throat> I got out of public service, I was in it for 17 years. And uh, <clears throat> one of the accomplishments I felt and felt best about was 1964 when the village celebrated 150th anniversary, sesquicentennial. We had a week in the summer of 1964, and uh, I got a committee together to handle work on that a year before that, <coughs> before that uh, week of the celebration. I remember one of the things uh, happening was uh, President Kennedy was shot during that period that we were meeting. And uh, so they named me the general chairman because I'd gotten it together and I was a mayor. So I was general chairman of the, but we had everybody working together and had a great time from that. And I always appreciated that. And my, my years in <coughs> as mayor were helped out because I had very good people running on council. I, I always, when somebody had to leave council, I talked to some other people about running and got good people running, get them elected. Did you feel like uh, any of your uh Military training prepared you for public service in any kind of way? Uh, any skills that translated 
that you learned in the military <laughs> that tra transferred over into that kind of work? Uh, oh, I think so. I think uh, definitely I, I was uh, com uh, company commander of the I ended up <coughs> originally I was a platoon leader of a rifle company and and uh, I had instruction at Fort Benning for three months. That helped. And the experience of leading men, uh, having to conduct classes, it helped. Certainly uh, being a mayor where you had to make a lot of decisions, particularly at that time, they had no village manager and uh, <coughs> uh, had a marriage court. So I had to be a judge and I had to be a manager. Uh, now, they got city manager and uh, <coughs> the municipal court that they started in the village did away with mayor's court. So the mayor doesn't have those two positions. <laughs> He's got a paid village manager and doesn't have to hold court. So that made it much easier. But, and I was uh, wondering about this since you were served in World War II and you were mayor I guess during the Vietnam era, did you have to deal mm -hmm. with a bunch of veteran issues in Boctavia? Was there were there guys that were serving oh. from the community in Vietnam, or uh, any uh, anything comes to mind yeah. about? Uh, really, I had no uh, problems as far as that was concerned with veterans. Uh, the problem was with the racial strife that we had. Uh, during that length of time, do you remember? They had cities that were burning and... Uh, right, well, Cincinnati had a little bit of that, but there was some of that going on in Bactavia? Uh, Racial no, tension? No, there was always a threat of that. But uh, we had no race relation problems at all. In fact, I had a, a member of council who was uh, African American. and. Uh, he was a good member of council. Uh, we named a street after him on Kilgore Avenue. And uh, uh, <coughs> we had wonderful relationships with the Negroes. I say that on, uh, during the 1964 sesquicentennial, I remember we, we should have won the state championship. And, uh, because we had uh, two very good uh, basketball players who were African American, and uh, <coughs> so fortunately we didn't have any of those. Well, we did have rumors. We had rumors during the sesquicentennial that said a carload of Negroes were going to be coming out from Cincinnati. That never developed. I think. We had a, had a good chief of police uh, both times. Uh, one who had been in there for years when I took over as mayor I was named Ed Connell, and uh, his family lived in New Richmond. But he was he was a good one. He knew <coughs> when some uh, break in would have occurred. He knew right away who it was because they were just released from the reformatory mm -hmm. or something to that effect. He kept up with that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so he always knew who was causing problems. So, well, what did you do after, uh, after you were mayor? What did you end up doing? Uh, you were still pretty relatively young at that point, right? In mm -hmm. mid-70s? Well... Of course, I was uh, working at the machine tool company. That was my regular job. You're doing that in addition to, mayor was in a full-time gig, huh? <coughs> oh, it was part-time. <laughs> yeah, but it took a, did take quite a bit of time. But, and I had my kids in school and <coughs> so anyhow, uh, I, uh, as far as my regular job, the machine tool company, uh, things were getting, in the late 70s, 
uh, started to get tough with foreign imports and uh, business was dropping off. And then my father had passed away and uh, so I decided uh, it was not a, I mean it was a stock held company. So I determined uh, along with the board of directors to sell. So I, we sold the company in 1972 and they kept me on, the old buyers kept me on uh, to run the company. And uh, they talked me. They, they talked to me about being there. They said they'd <coughs> be better if I take more time at the job and not with being there. So I, that's when I didn't run anymore after '75. And uh, <coughs> then, and I decided that I was, didn't want to stay. Uh, with somebody else telling me what to do as far as I had enough of that, so I, I left the company and uh, looked for another job. And I, did, I was, uh, <coughs> got a job with a very good company in Cincinnati, Mercury Instruments. They were in Fairfax and I, they hired me as a, as a purchase, purchasing manager because I'd done all that for the, my company anyhow, <coughs> besides being the engineer, et cetera. So I worked there until I was, uh, when I was 65, uh, I, they were, <coughs> they had a rule when I was, uh, they changed it in when I was 64. They didn't force me out at 65, <coughs> and they changed it to 70 which I was grateful for. And I like to think maybe they did it because of me, but I don't know that that was the case. But anyhow, <laughs> <coughs> I stayed till I was uh, at 70, and uh, I think I would like to have stayed for a while longer, but I was out. And it was a good company to, to work for. Uh, <coughs> That was the end of my, as far as working was concerned. So I was retired, not only from that, but retired from being mayor. That 17 years qualified me for what they call PERS, Public Employees Retirement and System, mm -hmm. which I didn't think too much about when I first got the first couple of years as mayor, but turned out to be a grateful thing covered by insurance and some pension. <laughs> so what do you, what do you been doing with yourself in your retirement years? How do you keep uh, active? Uh, you, you, you're oh. actually still very mm. sharp and uh, mm. seem to be well, physically I well. I married Juanita, that was a big help because <clears throat> I didn't, I learned I didn't want to live alone and uh, she keeps me busy. That's one of the things. And of course, one of the things we decided we didn't want to live in that large multi-level home. And uh, when they started this development out here and they called Lexington Run, they built these patio homes and uh, patio home is just the right size for a retired couple and uh, <coughs> in fact my children like it so much that I know after I pass on that they'll either want to stay or probably want to one of them or want to want to stay in it yeah it's and a nice place it's a nice uh, development here well I was a uh I just have one or two more questions. Did you uh, keep in touch with any guys that you served with? Yes, uh, we had, re that's another thing. Uh, <coughs> our division had a reunion every year. They formed the, what they call the Rail Splitter Society. And uh, the first reunion was fortunately in Cincinnati. And there were, of course, quite a few that were able to attend that. 
uh, I uh, got stayed in touch with that, and uh, I didn't go every year early in it. And there are two fellows that uh, <coughs> I got very closely acquainted with. That we were in the, uh, in the same regiment. We didn't know each other at the, during the war, but I got one of them that lives in Denver, Colorado. He unfortunately passed away a year ago, and uh, another one lived in California, and. Uh, but we went uh, through ASTP together. Uh, in fact, we were on the same softball teams and basketball teams. And uh, but Glenn Harris was the one that from California. He passed away. Uh, <coughs> I think maybe two years ago. So I have lost my contact. Well. <coughs> we, I remember when Juanita and I were first married, we went to Albany, New York, to a reunion there, and on the way she'd never been to Niagara Falls, so we were driving and we stopped over to see the falls, she was glad to see that. And in Albany, that was when I, <coughs> the, uh, Bill Ingram and Glenn Harris went to their first uh, uh, reunion in a long time, and that's where we met up again, 50 years after we'd <laughs> been together. And uh, so that <coughs> <coughs> we went to a number of reunions after that. We got to the uh, 65th, and it was in Cincinnati again, where I agreed to host the 65th that was going to be a next to last reunion, and since our first had uh, been 65 years before that in Cincinnati, I uh, agreed to chairman the uh, one in Cincinnati. I picked out Blue Ash and the Embassy Suites is where I held it, and they all said it was the best. Uh, that was the best hotel that they had ever had been in in all these years, and they thought it was one of the finest times that we had. What, what year was that, that reunion? That was five years ago, 1910, or 2010. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to keep up with these years. <laughs> they slipped by, and that was six years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, one last question, have you ever been back to Europe uh, and go back to any of the places? Yeah. that you were in? Uh, we were in 96, uh, that was, I think it was 96, or maybe it was 94. Anyhow, the 50th anniversary of the Battle of the Bulge, uh, our, we had a tour group uh, that was over, we had three tour buses that went to Europe. And I went, some of them took their wives, but I couldn't take my wife because she was on oxygen and had heart problems. And uh, <coughs> so we, at that time, visited uh, a lot of the places that, that I had been. And uh, during the uh, Ardennes, to the Bulge, that uh, house that we, uh, had the bazooka fire on the way. We visited that house again, and I had my picture taken and by the gate that we, the, the rocket hit and they welded the gate shut. And so I met, <coughs> there was a family all on that tour. We were in this city of uh, Verdun, or the town of Verdun, and uh, our, all three tour buses, uh, we were out, and a uh, Belgian officer who was a historian was giving us, bringing us up to date on how things were back during the bulge. And I saw this Belgian uh, 
uh, across the way, and he was um, showing a picture. And he, he worked his way around, he got around to us, and I was in the picture. He was looking to see who the group was. And we had gone back to up into Belgium and visited this farmhouse and uh, oh there were six or seven of us in the group who came up from Reims on a t on a <coughs> pass period. And uh, that <coughs> I was in that picture along with like a good friend from Elmira, New York, Mitchell. And uh, <coughs> he had married the teenager that was in that picture. Are you talking about this photo of you in the crossing the oh. Rhine? Or is this another? No, I've, I've got I've got the photo though that I, he was showing around. If uh, I've got it in an album. Uh, okay. Well, where did you get the photo of uh, you crossing the Rhine? The one that we looked at earlier. That. Oh, this picture here? Yeah. <coughs> well, I had first found that picture when we were in a town called Eberbach in our, when we were occupation troops. We were on the Necker River in a town, and uh, there was a bulletin board that had this photograph put on it. And so I took a picture of that photograph <coughs> and uh, then made copies of it and saw that it was all it had a it was all in French because uh, the explanation for it was because it was taken by a French photographer and <coughs> this particular picture my daughter who lives in Denver has uh, contacts in Washington I guess she she got that from the uh, um, whether it was the um, Congress or one of the big museums there. Or right, Library of Congress or something like that. It could have been that. And she, she uh, ordered one for each member of the family. Wow. And that was, <laughs> <coughs> so that was, uh, and I had a number of copies of, the, of that, uh, which uh, I had made too. Did so, you, on that on that visit to Europe in the 90s, did you uh, cover all the towns that you had been in, or just certain oh, certain parts? Not all of them, uh, <clears throat> because the division covered a lot of area. We went into the Geilenkirchen uh, and the city council there welcomed us and uh, gave us a little snack. And the city was rebuilt and it had been, been practically all destroyed as most of the big cities had been. And uh, <coughs> I think I was trying to remember, on, on, well this family that I had met, the guy that was passing the picture around, married the uh, teenager that was in the photograph and uh, so I met with them and uh, got acquainted with them. And when the, I was able to do that when the bus stopped in the town. And uh, actually, when Juanita and I made a trip over there, I got together with them again. I haven't written them. I should have. Shouldn't they're probably one of them still alive. Uh, Just drop a little Christmas card to them. Yeah, it was interesting meeting them, and and uh, <coughs> I think uh, we we had a one other trip. We just went to the British Isles, and uh, so I saw Stonehenge again. <laughs> but Stonehenge is all commercialized now. We got all. Have you seen, seen Stonehenge? Yourself? Yeah, yeah. I've been over there a couple of times. Yeah. Anyway. Well, well, I got I got one last question because we're running out of tape here. Oh, okay. Uh, I was wondering, did you ever take advantage of honor flight that they they do? You know, where they fly to DC. Yes. Have uh, you done that? Yeah. Well, 
I went uh, on the uh, grand opening of it when the uh, when President Bush spoke and uh, there were thousands of us there. And that was the uh, one that I went to. And so since I was there, well, I, I've been offered to go on the honor flight, but I haven't gone because I know they're still all doing that. And I said, since I was there, <coughs> I would like to have gone because I think they handled it a little, it was a little different. And now they handle it a little differently. You don't have it like it. Uh, well, I know there was one thing there were, must have been a thousand motorcycles there that same day. <laughs> But it was, uh, I did see it. And it, it's a good thing they do. I, I, I don't understand how they are able to afford to do it. They get enough <laughs> donations to do that, apparently. Yeah. Well, well I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about your time. And, and I enjoy doing it, <laughs> as long as I can keep my voice going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you.